and uh, Peter talks about the issue of remembrance in chapter 3 of his second epistle to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance verse 1 of chapter 3 that you be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior knowing this first that they shall come in the last day scoffers walking up their own lust and so on and then in chapter 2 talking about an entrance that shall be ministered unto in verse 11 of chapter 1 of that same epistle abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things though you know them and be established in the present truth so that in verse 15 I will endeavor that you may be able after my departure to have these things always in remembrance so there's a place for memory there's a place for reiteration there's a place to repeat and express again the great themes we can't hear them enough or know them enough or be reminded enough and I'm beginning to see that actually taking place here so Lord we do bless you that you attend my God to our remembrance our memories you said do this in remembrance of me there's a place for memory a vital place and we're asking you to stir us up my God in those things which we know but we don't know as we ought to know and can always afford to know and hear again yet more deeply Lord the timeless truths of the faith so come and use this occasion as you will knowing our frames, knowing my God where we are, what we need knowing the future as only you know it come and employ this time receiving our gratitude Lord for last night and the, the times that have preceded it and looking Lord as you continue to unfold your heart and will and bring us to the finale, the conclusion of these days bless this time by your presence, by your spirit, under your blood in Jesus name we pray Amen. Well, I have a uh, book by a Cambridge scholar, Bruce Longnecker, on Galatians, but he has certain insights about Paul and Paul's um, remarkable emphasis of being in Christ and what he exemplifies in the reality of his own life with regard to that that I, I find insightful so I'm going to read some of this and we'll see where it leads us in, in discussion Paul's talk of being in Christ assumes a rich complex of theological notions that go right to the heart of his theology behind it lies the motif of union with Christ that is the identification of the Christian with Christ in such an all-encompassing way that the Christian's own identity becomes intimately bound to and intertwined with that of Christ to the exclusion of all others. Paul explores this relationship of union from two angles. On the one hand, he speaks of the Christian being incorporated, incorporated into the events of Christ's death and resurrection. I've been crucified with Christ. And passages of this sort run throughout the whole of the Pauline Corpus, Romans 6 being the most extended statement. And then again, in Philippians and elsewhere, Galatians, Paul can speak of Christ being alive within the life, lives of Christians. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. This aspect of Paul's thought will be considered further on in this book. The Christian becomes the vehicle through which the living Christ is embodied or enfleshed. So Paul had an unusual appropriation in his own experience, and he makes his own experience the uh, paradigm for all the church. It's not unique to him, but because he knows it so intimately and so well, uh, that he knows that God's intention is this for all believers the union with Christ because one of the dilemmas that Paul had to face with the early church if you forsake the law 
How are you guided in righteousness? Because the law is full of explicit prescription on how to and what to. And if uh, touching the law nullifies grace, then how are you guided morally and ethically in the absence of the clear prescription of law? Do you understand that, that dilemma? And his answer is, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the union with the lawgiver, the union with the God of righteousness itself will, will, will find its expression in the issues that come before you as a believer as you walk in the spirit. So the issue of being in the spirit, being in Christ, is the issue of accessing righteousness and finding answer for the innumerable issues that come up for the believer where he doesn't have to have recourse to a law book or to explicit do's and don'ts or be sure to your shit. But he's moved by the spirit, the law of the liberty um, of God in Christ. And this is Paul's own distinctive experience that he models and um, enjoins all the church uh, to enter. And that's why he was so vehement with the Galatian believers who are flirting with circumcision and other such Judaic practices that having started in the spirit, are you going to be, com be completed in the flesh? The fact that you have received the spirit is the indication that what you are about is right in God. And having received the spirit is not just a little icing on the cake. The spirit is the life of God. And the spirit will guide you in those moral and ethical choices that you need to make as a believer in the absence of a uh, accessing a body of law and prescription it's a much more different different kind of walk so um, we, we need to be reminded of this Paul's experience is definitive and distinctive he sees in Christ as a motif that presupposes the notion of union with Christ that the Christian has a share in Jesus' own intimate, obedient sonship. And Paul speaks of that in Galatians, that we can say, Abba, Father, and come into the same relationship with the Father which Jesus himself had and exemplified, because to receive his spirit is to receive the spirit of sonship. So God forbid that these um, great observations become just items of doctrine or acknowledgement and are not the actuality of our life and our being and that the spirit himself becomes second place and not a vital first reality because to miss the spirit is to miss the life to miss the life is to miss the guidance miss, to miss the reality so, and I believe that we're suffering the eclipse of the spirit even in this charismatic generation union with Christ then is the mechanism whereby believers are incorporated into the sphere of the new creation the process whereby those enslaved to superhuman powers become sons of the sovereign God so we won't go to, you can look at that in Galatians where Paul says why do you go back again to these earthly things of what you shall touch or eat or wear or, or observe. You've moved out from that realm into the realm of spirit and don't fall back again in, into the ordinances in which the principalities and powers have a remarkable play and, and influence. The union with Christ is said to come through faith. Being baptized into Christ facilitates the union between Christ and the Christian for Paul baptism represents the believer's transfer from the domination of the power of sin to the realm of Christ's lordship so he's the great author of Romans chapter 6 Colossians chapters 2 and 3 no one explicates and sets forth the significance of baptism as entry into the life than Paul himself and that's what we have been seeking to bring again to remembrance. And what Paul sees as the transformation of the individual, the person of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, 
is also the key to the entire body of Christ. That the body of Christ itself becomes another kind of phenomenon of a spirit-led community and um, free from the law, free from entanglement, free from ordinances, moving in the remarkable liberty which is in Christ and the body itself uh, being led by God as much as the, as the individual believer and being in harmony one with the other over these things because they all share in the same spirit. So Paul has such a grandiose notion of the church, of the him be glory in the church, having been endowed and received the life of God by the Spirit, that every enablement is given to walk rightly according to the kingdom and the glory uh, wherein we have been called. And that's his confidence and his faith. And that's why he exhorts the believers and, uh, what's the word, ridicules them, having begun in the spirit, are you, are you going now to be completed by good falling back into the flesh? And then giving him his own life as an example in the same book of Galatians, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live not, not I, but Christ who lives in me, as being the model to which every believer is himself called. So Paul knows a lot of things that he's received directly not from man but directly from Christ and what he received in the first illumination that came to him when he beheld the face of Christ on the road to Damascus the revelation that came to Paul is beyond all accounting the depth of it even the uh, richness that was invested in him from the very first has its later outworking in the things that he writes and by which he guides the church so he received in a light that exceeds that of the noonday sun a remarkable flash of revelation about the whole nature of faith itself of law, of justification, of sin, of judgment, of righteousness, of atonement and so we can almost say that the, the outworking of Paul's life is the registering of this massive revelation into those things that come to us through his various epistles. He doesn't say how he knows it, but he knows that any deferring to the law again, any condescension to the Judaic system as a supplement to the faith negates the entire faith. And because he says that, I don't need any further proof or confirmation or say, how do you know? If he says it for me, that's enough. Because who is it who is saying it? It is Paul, the chief apostle, the one to whom this remarkable revelation has been given and uh, should be definitive for all the church. And I'm, uh, in my last trip I was talking about, I'm about a renaissance of Paul. I'm encouraging a renaissance, a return to Pauline doctrine, theology, to the man himself as being the definitive foundation for all the church. See how radical a switch this represents from the external obedience to a body of law in the Judaic fashion in which Paul himself was a master to being in Christ, that in Christ is the fulfillment of all righteousness and the fulfillment of the law. So it's a remarkable ideological shift from one kind of an emphasis to another. So everything is now centered in the Christ who has come and in that union with him is the fulfillment of the righteousness of the law and why he's so insistent and exemplifies in his own life that union and boasts in it and calls us to the same relationship. So for Jews hearing this, uh, it's, what shall we say? It's a radical introversion. It's a forsaking of uh, of a body of practices that is honored by time and in which they delight them to establish their own righteousness though, though Paul makes clear that failure in one point is failure in all and then Christ has come and in him now is, is a new fulfillment by union with him so um, to commend that to men is Paul's function 
And he cannot do it academically. He commends it in word, but he commends it in practice. He's the living embodiment. He's the personification. And maybe for that reason, those who were insistent upon a righteousness through law could not abide Paul's very presence and said the man is not fit to live and vowed they would neither eat nor drink until he was dead. But we need to represent how radical an alternative the, the coming of Christ is to a whole system of law attainment through man's uh, effort that in one fell swoop by the advent of Christ that system is made null and void and Christ himself becomes the alternative by being in union with him through baptism. Do you realize how radical that is? What a switch of total polarities and how to commend it to men in, in his generation what Paul's task was and why he's so emphatic in his insistence upon this and believes that this is the key for the entire church itself and fights against any attempt by Judaizers to woo uh, the church or Gentiles back into any semblance of the law by which grace is negated. I don't know that we have understood how radical a thing uh, has come with the advent of Christ himself. We mustn't be disdainful of the law as if the law is inherently defective because Paul says the law is holy. The, 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 the problem is that the flesh cannot fulfill the law there's the inherent weakness in man but the law itself is good and holy and indeed the heart of the law is to be fulfilled in the righteousness which is ours in Christ that the righteousness of the law will find its fulfillment not its neglect so God never forsakes the righteousness of the law but rather intends its its fulfillment by being in Christ now remember that Paul says that the law was a teacher, a school teacher, to bring us to Christ. So it has functions, not the least of which is to show the inadequacy in our flesh to fulfill it, so that when Christ comes, we appreciate the grace now that is in Him through our union in baptism. So this is a remarkable and complex thing that Paul is has to work his way through to instruct the church of his generation and all generations because the issue of law, law keeping, uh, is yet a, an issue in the church. Maybe not in those explicit terms so much as some propensity in our soul to find a supplement to our salvation by acts that we can perform uh, uh, independent of the law. There's a propensity toward law, toward ordinances, toward deeds, toward yeah. doing, that, that is a continual threat for the church. The church is passing through its birth pangs and the life of the threat of heresy, of the misconstruing of the faith, um, even to understand what Christ represented, came after his death and resurrection. So we, we need to have a great sympathy for the establishing of the tenets of the faith that come to us through the apostles in the earliest generations of the church where to misconceive uh, the truth is to allow that error that would have brought the entire faith into ruin so Paul is the jealous overseer he's the steward of the mystery of the gospel and of the faith and is working his way through all of the naughty issues of law and faith of the righteousness through human attainment so called and that which is to be had through appropriation and union through baptism and no one explicates and sets forth the, these great understandings more than he but it's time for the church to return to these foundations and to be brought into remembrance of them as Peter says and then to walk in them with a, a certain consciousness we need to remember Stephen's address. Who is he facing but the doctors of the law, the very foundation of Judaism of his generation, and saying, you received the law by the ministration of angels, but you did not keep it. 
as your fathers did, so do you also. You do always err against the Holy Spirit. When they heard this indictment, they lashed, they bore upon him with their teeth. They were vexed to the point of stoning the man uh, to obliteration. But he charged them, you received the law through the angels, but you did not keep it. So it's a remarkable indictment, which of course, Paul then being so hearing that, and uh, then allowing that word to be the kicks against which, the, the prodding against which he kicked. We need to understand the root of uh, attraction in law keeping. Why men want to succeed on the basis of their own virtue, their own religiosity to establish a righteousness of their own, which is completely scuttled and made null and void by the advent of Christ. So the advent of Christ, the coming in its suddenness and its radicalness, is such a remarkable challenge to the to the world of Judaism that we can hardly estimate it. And of course the controversy remains to this day, 2,000 years later, still bucking against what he represents and still seeking to establish themselves according to their own effort in, in the law of fulfillment as righteousness. It's a great historic, what shall I say, head-on collision. And we need to uh, appreciate that because we're called to exempl exemplify the new reality that comes to us in Christ. And in such a way as to move Jews to jealousy. Yeah. That uh, we're not law avoiding or uh, immune or Im impervious to law or to righteousness. Quite the contrary. We are as jealous or more jealous than they. And that somehow in our conduct corporately we are evidencing a fulfillment of it not through a practice of legalism or ordinances but through the life of God in the Spirit, having been joined with Him in union through baptism. Amen. See, that's, this is the task of the church. But if we fall short in that appropriation and that exhibition, they lose the testimony and the witness that comes uniquely through us, all the more powerful when it issues through Gentiles. The last place that Jews expect to see the righteousness of God is in Gentiles. But what, is the, what does the Scripture say? That... The light to lighten the Gentiles is also the glory of the people Israel. Yeah. And when I was confronted 42 years ago uh, uh, outside of uh, a city in Switzerland by a simple American Christian girl on vacation who was willing to spend time with this fearful stranger and I'm continually probing her motives as we walked having been a disillusioned ex-Marxist communist world changer. How is it you're being kind to me? Uh, why aren't you afraid of me? She would answer every question in the same way. It's the love of God, Art. It's the love of God. I couldn't bear to hear that phrase. And finally I thought, if she mentioned that one more time, she's had it. <laughs> and sure enough, she did. And I said, look, you're a nice kid and all that. I appreciate your kindness, but I cannot stand this God talk. Answer for me one question that no Christian has ever successfully answered. You're talking about God that he is. How do you know that he is? I thought, here, a little brittle Sunday school answer, which I'll explode with my intellectual steamroller. This little girl with her freckled face, sandy head, Gentile countenance, looked up at me without a moment's hesitation. She said, Archie said, I know that God lives. He lives in me. And down went the ox. Fell on the spot. I was brought down in the power of that statement. And finally, like a boxer, finally recovering was what hit me what did she say it wasn't even intellectual let alone theological what gave that statement its power and then I recognized it was true in that little snub nosed snub nosed gentile pasty sandy haired face showed the glory of God she had the light that lightened the gentiles which is also the glory of the people of Israel and I'm glimpsing it for the first time as a Jewish atheist in that gentile face there's no more powerful testimony and witness to the Jew than the reality of our God and the righteousness and the, the um, aura of God as is it exhibited in the, le the last place we expect to find it, a Gentile and in their face. Mm -hmm. And that's why it says in Ezekiel 20 about the wilderness trek of Israel, I will meet with you in the wilderness of the nations face to face. There's a confrontation ahead 
of which my own experience over 40 years ago is a little minuscule expression, but the larger grand fulfillment of the nation being sifted through the nations is for this encounter to glimpse the face of God in those Gentiles that will take them in in their moment of adversity and affliction. Under, under great challenge themselves and threat in doing so, but they show not a face of religious obligation because that would lose it. They show the face of God. They show the love. They show the, the, the unconditional acceptance of this people, even in that condition, being mean-spirited, nasty. What we exhibit with our faces in that crisis moment is the whole sum and substance of the redemptive genius of God come to pass in a final moment. Will we have a face like that to show? See what I mean? Unless we have been characteristically and consistently walking in that realm of grace long before the final encounter comes. And, if, and most especially tested within the church. What are we showing to each other in the moments of irritation when we rub with one another in the various uh, tensions and conflicts which are to be found in the church when it moves from the casual Sunday conglomeration into the intensity of life called community. And that's why com when the Lord brought us to this place at the top of the road here, the words that he gave was dominion, end time teaching center, community refuge. No refuge without community. But church is more than just a, 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 a casual assemblage of believers on Sunday for the purpose of, of service. Church is more effectually a community of believers. And when it becomes that, in the frequency of contact and in the issues that are generated are the tensions and frictions by which the sanctifying work takes place so that when we have to face them in a final moment, we have been prepared for it. We have been tested by each other so that the Jew, whatever his condition, will not reveal some unsanctified aspect of us that shows itself in our faces as resentment, irritation, fear, or any such thing. They've got to see the clear face of God. As I saw it on the road with that young girl, with such impact that it set in motion my salvation. So these are great issues. I will not obtain them in a day, but the question is, are we in a framework by which that sanctifying process can take place? Or are we still in a kind of Sunday service orientation by which we have a Sunday face that we're able to maintain for one or two hours and pat each other on the back in the foyer of the church and go home to our privacy unchanged? We need to be together far more frequently and far more intensively than mere services. And that's where the sanctifying work takes place. And that's why God is speaking now. I guess what needs to be communicated is some glimpse of the end time realities of which he may not be aware. Because most of these pastors are so centered in their career, the success of the church, that they don't, don't take into consideration the end and purpose of the church. And if they've lost the mystery of Israel, that's the centerpiece. So we who have some sense of these things need to communicate it to these men to the degree that they're willing to hear. Pray for their understanding to be opened. But the events of our time will increase in their intensity. We will see much, much, many more Lebanons, many more crises. We'll see them closer to home. We'll see Jews being shot in their offices like in Seattle where that uh, Islamic fanatic went up and killed a couple of secretaries and wounded four or five others. We'll see a greater frequency until the reality and urgency of these issues becomes indisputable and near. We've been living in a fool's paradise and we need to be open for reality so those of us who have some sense of this have a particular responsibility in the congregation which is a reason for us not to flee not to find greener pastures where we're received and with understanding, but to remain in the place where God has called us, however destitute of hope it may presently seem, and there to remain faithful. Your pastor will hear from you and be open to consider what you say to the degree that he can trust you 
because you have consistently demonstrated a, a trust in which he's confident that you're not his enemy, you're not his threat, that you really have his best interest and that of the church at heart, and you have consistently demonstrated that in your long tenure in the church. So our presence in the church as it presently is constituted and our witness there is of uttermost importance. And it takes wisdom and uh, grace, which of course, again, issues out of the life of God. What to say, when to say, when to hold silent, knowing that we will be misunderstood, we'll be accused of being off-tangent, and that we're no longer on Christ or unto Israel, whatever, however the accusations, and to bear reproach, to bear present misunderstanding, and to show ourselves consistently faithful and uh, uh, trustworthy until the day that something from us can be heard and can be received. So our presence in the church is the great crisis. And uh, by being faithful and patient there, the Lord is at the same time using those ingredients and trials as sanctifying measures for ourselves in patience, in forbearance, in wisdom, in love, and all of the kinds of things that need to be uh, established in us. Because so many of us have... Uh, um, come out of Babylon mentalities and, and reckless and uh, we need ourselves to be tempered and matured and how we conduct ourselves in the church in its present constitution is a remarkable provision for our own refinement as I said at the end of a conversation yesterday here how David responded to Saul had everything to do with the future of the Davidic kingdom how one responds to the, to the system that is on its way out, that is no longer anointed, and even opposed to the Davidic thing, is the critical key for what the new thing will be as it, as it is introduced. David's patience, forbearance, and genuine submission, when he, when he called Saul my father, yeah. and went down on his face, he was not just employing a tactic, a tactic in order to be ingratiating and get Saul off his back. It was a genuine heartfelt emotion for a fallen king already apostate, already opposing the Davidic thing, and yet he expressed this genuine affection and carried this act of deference into the whole nature of the Davidic kingdom, which is its glory uh, when it will be established forever. So how we respond to the passing system, how we relate to it, uh, whether we will be critical or judgmental or patient and, and um, gracious is the whole key to what we bring into the future itself. So we mustn't despise Saul. We mustn't despise what we consider to be Babylonian, worldly, carnal. It's of necessity that but how we relate to it and express is not an endorsement of carnality, but a patience of the Lord toward all the church, whatever its present condition. He loves the church. That's the church. And it's a suffering. There's a suffering that remains in the body for Christ's sake until he come. And I used to think it always meant a suffering because of external persecution. But I think the most acute suffering is to be faithful and patient in church situations by which we know we're going to sit through wearisome uh, services and, uh, and pointless sermons and flesh and uh, uh, other kinds of kinds of things that make us wince. But we bear it. We sit, we patiently bear. Is a suffering. And because you'll bear that suffering, God will hear your petitions and your supplications all the more. Yeah. Your very presence in that suffering of a spiritual kind is working something in the heavenlies that will bring the release both of the pastor and the congregation into the reality to which we are all called in the last days. Are you following me? Yeah. How you deport yourself in the church as it presently is, is critical for all the future. It's the cross. It's a suffering. It's an anguish of a particular moral and spiritual kind. We'd rather be where the action is where there's a real word and, and real apostolic reality and here we are stuck in this little thing that doesn't seem to be going anywhere 
and having to listen to the programs and designs of men that, that make us chafe. But bear it. Bear it and bear it with grace. Look upon your present condition and situation, however painful to bear, as God's exquisite provision for your sanctity. So that in that day you'll have the face to show of the unconditional love of God because you have passed through the trials within the church that fits you for that depiction. If we're to extend mercy that may that they may obtain mercy, the Jews, what about present mercy? in the church yeah. one of the first times that I preached this a black lady cried out of the congregation but Archie said we're to have mercy for each other how should we have it for Jews mm -hmm. exactly yeah. there's time for mercy right now within the yeah. church with pastors who are ambitious concerned for their careers they are insecure they need to be upheld in, in a merciful attitude and not a condemnatory one by which we correct them and show them the way if we'll not exhibit mercy now in our present situation, will we have it then? The mark of an immature saint is that they're rushing now to express the revelation that has come to them. And they will be the key to the illumination of others. But they need more likely, more properly to hold it and be contained, which is a form of suffering. Um, the Lord will give you a vision for something and you think that because you have the vision that that is an endorsement for its, its present enactment but he's giving it to you now not to express but to hold and to hold something in vision even for years before he allows the expression work, uh, uh, is a working refinement within so the Lord gave me a call to Germany as the key to Israel's salvation I lived in Denmark, Inga's country we moved through Germany on more than one occasion and I, my mouth was sealed. It took seven years before the Lord allowed the first expression of involvement in Germany having given the call seven years before. It raises the question, why did they just give the call closer to the time for the fulfillment? But because holding it for seven years did an inward work of a necessary kind. So don't rush home now and tell everybody and, and straighten them out and, and enlighten them you may just have to hold it you may just have to be quiet until such time as the Lord will allow its release but the holding of it is your refinement okay you guys need to draw out the heart of the Lord through your responses through the, any question that is raised because I think this is an outstanding survey of the uniqueness of Paul in the appropriation of the Christ life which is really known uh, among believers today and needs to be part and parcel of uh, what we exhibit in truth so Paul's own life is set up as a paradigm of the embodiment of the transforming power of God his own modeling of Christian transformation. No one provides a better model of Christian transformation than an authentic apostle whose life can and should be imitated. You know the frequency in which Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ? It almost sounds audacious and vain, as if to follow him is one and the same as following Christ, and in fact it is. And he speaks it with complete, what's the word? Um unobtrusive attention to himself he's so free from vanity so free from ego that he can say follow me yeah. it's the evidence itself of the life that, that it's not a self-conscious vanity by saying well don't think that I'm some special thing he just boldly puts it out there if you see me you see what it is to which you yourself are called and follow me in it as I exhibit it and you're called also so to do. There's something about Paul that is so free from the taint of religious self-consciousness and vanity. It's, it's guileless and precious, which is the testimony of the life. For and, uh, There's nothing in which he shall boast. He's the embodiment. He's got to be the, the, the picture of this. That's what an apostle is. The model, he, he's modeling for all the church the reality to which 
the church is to be called. So we need to dwell upon Paul, the man, his conduct, his doctrine, what he exhibits. So in the revelation of Christ to him, Paul's own identity became caught up in a process of transformation whereby Christ himself invaded Paul's own person. You can almost not say where Paul ends and Christ begins when the man says, for me to live is Christ. And what do we see in Peter? Peter is utterly transformed. His epistles are so contrary in, in what was exhibited right to the point where he betrayed Christ. Something happened with the advent of Pentecost and the subsequent dealings of God that his nature is remarkably transformed. You wonder that how this fisherman could write so preciously as he does uh, in, the, in um, his epistle in chapter 3 about women, sub wives submit to husbands and uh, be uh, chaste and with a meek and quiet spirit which is uh, precious in God's sight. It's almost poetry. You wonder how a fisherman is capable of this kind of expression. But it's the life of God now transmuting and altering Peter and bringing forth the apostolic reality in him which is distinctly different from Paul and yet precious in itself. So we're given opportunity to observe these men coming into a fullness through the life of Christ as apostles and not just being stamped off the assembly line where you can't distinguish one from the other they become some mechanical repetition but retaining a uniqueness uh, and differences that are precious and valuable for the church because Peter expresses things in a way that is exquisite that, uh, that Paul does not even begin to touch and vice versa and so what would it be if all the church shines forth in an apostolic reality coming forth in the uniqueness of its individuality livened by the life of Christ and expressing itself as fully and as amply as was done through Paul and, and uh, Peter through the Christ life in them can you imagine such a church that's the church for which God is waiting and unto him be glory in that church so Paul speaks of his encounter with the risen Christ as an occasion when his own identity was transformed to such an extent that he became himself a vehicle through which Christ is revealed among the Gentiles. God's eschatological invasion of Paul's world resulted not just in enlightenment, but in enlivenment. He talks about God's eschatological invasion of Paul's world. The person of Paul was invaded by the life of Christ in his resurrection glory. And he does, it did not just bring enlightenment, as great as that enlightenment was, but enlivenment. It brought a new quality of life and being. The genius of Paul as the apostle was that life was revealed in me. Christ was formed in him. Paul, who claims to have died with Christ, describes Christ as living in him, animating his own existence, so that Christ's own faithful life before God marks out Paul's life as well so it's not an exaggeration to say Paul is the very continuation of Christ what Christ could not have communicated even up and to and through his own resurrection and ascension is now given over to a successor Paul who would express us now by that life those things that the Lord himself would have expressed were he to continue in this earthly realm you understand? Yeah. That, that Christ can, can entrust to Paul this continuance and this expression in this crisis of the church in its infancy indicates to what degree they were in that complete union. And even if, where Paul says, I give you this not by requirement, but I just offer it as an opinion, so to speak, has come down to us 2,000 years later as binding and as compelling as anything that was given to him as requirement that even his opinion is more than just a human vagary even his opinion is the expression of the life of Christ in him I'm very fond of uh, citing 1 Thessalonians 
as a picture of the apostolic man again written without any thought that subsequent generations would be studying it as a text and just written directly to the church as encouragement but in it are communicated such things as to reveal the apostolic glory as for example chapter 1 where he says in verse 5 for our gospel came not unto you in word only but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake and you became followers of us and of the Lord look at that equation you became followers of us and of the Lord there's no break to be followers of us is to be followers of the Lord and he can say that unashamedly uh, that has nothing to do with being vain but the key is that the gospel came to them in such power as to turn them from their idols to serve the living God just as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake apostolic character is the issue of apostolic power charisma is the issue of character and we have lost that connection in our charismatic generation where we're just so power oriented that we, do, we give scant attention to the character of the vessel uh, through whom that anointing is expressed and so in many cases the anointing itself can be questioned it's specious what form does it take how does it express itself is it exalting the man in his ministry or is it performing the work of God in a selfless way as was true with Paul Paul can say to the Thessalonians, you know what manner of man we were among you for your sake. That's a bold assertion because he knew that they would say yes. Your character, your consistency, your love, you never exploited us, you never used your title to intimidate us, you never laid a number on us, you never threatened, you never employed your office in such a way as to compel us in a way that was ungodly you were always judicious you were you were a nursemaid you were a mother to us you were a father to us in fact he says I not only gave you the gospel but my own soul also and this is a Jew toward Gentiles this is remarkable it's not a man being uh, official and doing his duty where there's an inward yet resentment to be that condescending to non-Jews but there's a genuine love for these Thessalonians and he's exhibiting a character in which he does not have to consciously put his best foot forward he simply is what he is in God and he says and you know what manner of men we were among you he could not be other than what he was so we need again to be restored to the issue of apostolic character as being foundational to the issue of apostolic charisma foundational to the issue of apostolic work he picks up that theme of his own conduct as an example and as a release to the acceptance of his word in verse 9 of chapter 1 when he speaks verse 8 about the faith that has come to the church uh, in that part of the world for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus uh, which delivered us from the wrath to come shows the extent of the gospel the message that they received far more extensive and deep and detailed and eschatological than the gospel we have heard and have received from men who are not apostolic he gave them the whole counsel of God that included the day of his wrath and to wait for his son who will come from heaven who will save us from the day of his wrath they were saved not only now and immediately but they were saved eternally from the judgment and the wrath of God by the advent of his son Paul gave them the whole counsel and he gave it to them so vividly and so powerfully that it, they turned from their idols to serve the living God they didn't become mere pew sinners they themselves were transformed by the message because you know what manner of entry we had among you you received our word because you received us 
because we were the exemplification of the word. The man himself was the message, not just what he verbally stated. And so this is what is apostolic, and this is what God is wanting in the entire church. Again in chapter 2, verse 1, For ourselves, brother, know what entrance in unto you that was not in vain. And then he details his conduct in verse 5, that we never use flattering words, as you know, as a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. Not only are you our witness, God is witness of what kind of men we were among you. Neither of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome. But we were gentle among you, even as the nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. How is it that these Thessalonian pagans, Gentiles, uncircumcised, were dear to Paul, the Pharisee of the Pharisees? Is he putting it on? Is he exaggerating? Or was it a genuine affection that he felt for this people and, and they sensed and, and were disarmed from their fear? Because a Jew bringing an alien message is suspect. And yet, their fear and, and, and um, apprehension about what Paul represented as a Jew was completely dissolved because of his apparent love for them expressed as a nursemaid not just in bringing the gospel but my own soul also this is the genius this is if you want to put in the scalpel and lay it, bear the scripture and get at the heart of what an apostle is in himself as a thing in himself, we have it here. All the more remarkable as it is exhibited as a Jew, not a Jew only, but a Hebrew of the Hebrews and a Pharisee of the Pharisees in his own life, to the Goyim, to the Gentiles, to the object of fear and enmity with Jews that have been historic. That he has transcended this cultural enmity and communicates an authentic affection and love for them as dear to him as to his own people, has got to be nothing less than the reality of the life of Christ in him. This is not put on. This is not affectation. This is not self-conscious show. This is the unconscious outworking of the very love of God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves the Thessalonians and that love is expressed through Paul because God has transcended his cultural, racial, and natural limitations to bring him into the unlimited union with Christ by which the love of God himself is exhibited consistently and uh, un self-consciously to the point where their hearts are one to receive both the man and his message. Got the picture? You see how important this life, this Christ life is. Anything less than that would have failed. Paul was a bachelor from every reckoning. How could he have known in the natural what fatherhood is, that he should be such a spiritual father in his generation? If he did not obtain it naturally by his own experience through marriage as father of raising children, where did he obtain this fatherhood? He obtained it from God the Father through the Son. He obtained it in a direct access to the innate nature of God, which is fatherly. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing exhibited here. This deep appropriation of the life includes the capacity for fatherhood where he can say, follow me as I follow Christ and be such an example. So the whole amplitude of what is available in God is transmuted and expressed through that one who's in union with that God through baptism into death and into resurrection and into newness of life. Paul was converted to the uttermost, as our brother has reminded us. The death of his conversion is awesome. It was nothing less than as death to his whole past because he saw that what was the result of my zeal? In the end, what did, what did it make of me my Judaic concern for, 
for uh, Judaism and law. It made of me a persecutor and murderer, a very God himself. So what value was there in it that in any way needs to be retained? It was brought into a complete death by the death of Christ, that it could be brought into a complete union with the life of Christ. May our, may our conversions be as deep. Yeah. So what value in reading of his conversion, which is undoubtedly deeper than what we ourselves have experienced, except that it prompts us to a like appropriation. And that we can even pray, Lord, to whatever degree my conversion lacked the measure of depth that Paul found, I'm asking that you would impart that to me. I want as deep a depth as he knew and as deep a union as he exhibited. And uh, the Lord has ways and means. If you did not experience this initially in conversion, I believe that the Lord has ways to enhance and deepen the depth uh, of our own conversions that we could be saved to the uttermost. We're saved, but we're not saved to the uttermost. So we can ask the Lord to supply whatever measure was wanting in our initial experience. Certainly that was true for me when I came to the Lord over 40 years ago. I didn't even know what sin or repentance meant. I just called upon the name of the Lord. And the knowledge of sin and, re and atonement came subsequent to, to my conversion. I called upon the name of the Lord. Something in fact happened. I was born again of the Spirit. But the deeper working followed and did not precede that conversion. Somehow our conversion is proportionate to our call. Paul's conversion was utterly radical and deep to the uttermost because his call was ultimate in an apostolic way. So we just have to believe that the Lord mediates right from the inception of our spiritual life a conversion appropriate to what it is to which we're called. But I think we could still yearn for the deeper realizations to come to us. He's not ashamed both to appeal to the Thessalonians and to God how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged everyone he was as a father does his children. Here in the same chapter he refers as a nurse, refers to himself as a father, what, to what end that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. All of this great work in the conversion of the Thessalonians was proportionate to the depth of the word that they received through Paul which came to them in verse 13 not as the word of men but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually works also in you that believe. They received an apostolic word an apostolic witness and it affected their own conversion in such a way as to turn from their idols to serve the living God what does that mean? it would inflame those Thessalonians who yet live in that idolatry they would stand out conspicuously in an, as an island of faith in a community still subscribing to its idolatries and they would be looked upon as betrayers of the tradition and culture uh, of that people to have adopted an alien Hebraic faith would be looked upon as, as betrayal. So for them to stand in that place in this new witness is a remarkable statement of the depth of what was wrought in them through Paul's word where he says that you know that the word that came to you was not the word of man but the word of God which performs a work effectually in you that belief. And that work is so deep it will enable you to stand against opposition, against persecution, against reproach, and anything, any consequence that will follow you, this faith, that will call, bring upon your heads a suffering you need not have borne if you had remained pagans. They received something from Paul that enabled them to stand and to be a witness throughout the whole of the ancient world. So deep was the word that came in power and authority because you know what manner of man we were among you for your sake. Elsewhere Paul says, for, the, for your sake and for the Lord's sake. You never hear Paul talking about for his sake. There's never a thought about how anything, any aspect of his conduct affects him. It's always for the believer and for the Lord. Their sake, your sake, never his sake. 
is a precious selflessness that is not an affectation. It is apostolic character. It's the very character of the Lord himself.